Amen. Well, if you'll turn with us tonight to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 25. And while you're turning, I want to say I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I love Brother John Morgan. Amen. And uh, thank God for his faithfulness and his stand. And uh, there's never, and I, I'm going to say this, there's never been a day in my life that, uh, I've, been, that I've been sorry that uh, I was his friend and he was mine. Amen. And uh, I thank the Lord for Brother Morgan and his family and the Mount Carmel Baptist Church and how God has used them uh, uh, to just be a blessing to all of us. Let us get and be in this atmosphere. I want you to pray about the offering. Uh, they need 8500 8, more dollars to uh, pay for the meeting and at the close of the service. It sure would be a blessing if God would touch some people's heart and we could meet that need and it would take such a burden off this church and off this uh, moderator, and you know, we'll turn the lights out, we'll get in our cars, and we'll go home, and we'll say, man, what a great meeting that was, wasn't Friday night good, but somebody's got to pay the rest of that bill, amen, and I believe God's big enough to send it all in tonight, don't you, and uh, so you just be praying about it, ask the Lord what he'd have you to do, and uh, you never know, there may be somebody here who just write a check for $8,500, and uh, just be a blessing to this, I pro uh, this uh, church and this man of God, I know the Lord will bless you for that. I want to preach just a few moments tonight. I, I thank God for what we've already heard. Amen. And, and preaching on sin doesn't make me nervous. Amen. And a preacher getting up and naming sin like we heard tonight doesn't make me nervous. Amen. I tell you what makes me nervous is when preachers can never preach on sin or when they can preach on sin and never name nothing. That makes me very nervous. Nervous, amen, and uh, thank God for what we've heard tonight, but I have a burden on my heart, just a simple thought, but just a, a burden tonight about uh, to the young people as, as in particular, uh, but I think it'll be a help to all of us tonight as well for just a few moments. Genesis chapter 25 and verse number 29. Genesis 25 and verse 29. The Bible says, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Notice this last phrase, thus Esau despised his birthright. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us these next few moments. God, I don't want to say anything that would not be led by the Spirit of God, and I pray that you would help us not to grieve you in any way, but may you be glorified. I pray that your son would be magnified and the church would be edified tonight. Help us to do exactly what you would lead us to do. And Lord, I pray that you would move mightily in this service, bless the invitation, speak to every heart, and do something eternal. Lord, I pray for the offering tonight, God, that you would meet the need in full, that you would get the glory, that you would get the honor. And Lord, we'll thank you and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen, amen. You can be seated tonight. I want you to think about these two brothers in this text for just a few moments. I know that you're no stranger to them nor to the scripture that we have read tonight. But you'll notice in verse number 24 down through verse number 26, the Bible uh, gives detail to their birth. The word of God says here that when her days were to be delivered, uh, uh, delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all over like a hairy garment and they called his name Esau. And after there came out his brother out. And so it talks about their birth, their birth in these first few verses here that are leading up to this text. And then in verse 26, the, the Bible highlights their bitter revival, uh, 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 their bitter rival. As the Word of God says here that as they were being born, uh, the Bible says that he took his hand and took hold of Esau's heel. So there's a rival that takes place that begins at their birth. And, and the Bible highlights that, their birth, their bitter revival, and their uh, 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 rival. And then it talks about their boyhood in verse number 27. The Bible says that the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And so we know that these two boys uh, uh, were twins, but yet they were individuals. And I want to say tonight that if you're a parent here, it doesn't matter if you have two children or, or three children or five children or ten children. It does us all to be reminded that every one of them is unique 
in the way that God made them and we should not compare them to each other. We should not uh, expect the same out of each other because God made them as individuals. They, they have different talents, different abilities, different personalities, amen? And so these boys uh, were born on the same day, but yet they were individuals. They, they had different interests in life. And, and so the Bible talks about uh, their boyhood as they grew up. And then in verse number 29, uh, the Bible talks about their blemishes. Uh, I mean, listen, you think about Jacob and Esau. They were, uh, they were brought up in a, in a great patriotic family of faith. Isn't that right? But when you get to verse number 28, the Bible clearly says that Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So here we have this godly family uh, that has a, a great heritage behind them, but yet the parents have favoritism amongst who they like one over the other. You know, when I think about these boys and I think about the blemishes that we read about in their life, uh, it's interesting that it didn't so much start with them as it did with their parents. Amen? You see, mom and dad, you and I have got to be very careful that we don't cultivate and we don't create uh, and we don't fertilize the problems uh, uh, that are already in our children's lives. Amen? Uh, we're to be balanced. We're to treat them equally. And we've got to be very careful as we see in the life of Isaac that we do not love people for the natural things uh, that they can do in our life. Amen? You see, the Bible says three times that Isaac uh, loved Esau because he brought him venison. You know, it's interesting. There are some people, and I'm not just talking about children, but I'm talking about even in church. Uh, uh, Brother Stacy. there are some people, uh, listen, they're not givers, they're takers. Amen? I mean, they love the church for what they can get out of it. Let's just be honest. Amen? Uh, they're for what others can do for them. But thank God for people that are genuine in their love. Uh, they don't want anything in return. Uh, they love you not because of what you do, but because of who you are. Amen? And these boys have these blemishes. But when we get to this text, the Bible highlights the birthright. And the birthright is mentioned, you'll notice it's mentioned in verse number 31, and it's mentioned in every verse from verse number 31 down to verse number 34. It's mentioned four times. In fact, it's the last word in our text tonight. The birthright is very important. When you think about these boys and you think about the birthright that Esau had, you might even ask yourself, what is the big deal about the birthright? I would tell you tonight the birthright is important because of what the birthright represents. You see, the birthright represents several things. Number one, it represents the father's honor. Amen. You see, this birthright had been passed down from Abraham. It had been passed down to, uh, to Isaac, from Abraham to Isaac, and now it's going to be passed down to Esau. And so it represents the father's honor. And then the birthright represents the family heritage. Amen. He who holds the birthright. Uh, and listen, it meant that he had right to the family authority. It meant that he held the family heritage. Uh, what had been passed down from generation uh, to generation, that birthright was important because it represented the heritage uh, of that family. So it's important because it represents the father's honor. It was a great honor to give that birthright to the first son. It was a great, it represented the family heritage. Uh, and then it also represented represented financial help, amen? Because he who had the birthright uh, was entitled to a double portion of the father's wealth, amen? So that meant that Esau would get a double portion of what Isaac had. And so it's very important for that reason. It's also important because it represented a future hope. Uh, as it is in this family, what it meant was that God had made a covenant with Abraham and God had promised that through Abraham's seed that there would come a Messiah, that he would come, the Lamb of God would come. And so when that birthright is being passed down from Abraham to Isaac and what, would, what they would have thought to have been to Esau, uh, then what it represented was the promise of the Messiah. It had a spiritual blessing. It had a financial blessing that came with it. It had a family blessing that came with it. It represented the Father's honor. It represented the family heritage. Uh, it represented uh, financial help. Uh, it represented presented future hope. Amen. I think you'll agree with me tonight that this birthright is very, very important. Isn't that right? 
You know, tonight, you think about where God found us. It doesn't matter if God found you off a bar stool or a church pew. I promise you there's one thing we all had in common. No matter where he found us and no matter where we came from, we all come out of the same pit. Isn't that right? Every one of us was a nobody headed nowhere on a highway to hell lost without God. We didn't have no hope in this world. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. I'm telling you, we was destined to die. We deserved to die. We were just sinners without God. But whether it be off a church pew or a bar stool, uh, the grace of God came to us one day, uh, rescued us out of sin, uh, uh, took us out of nothing, uh, and put us into everything, uh, uh, took us off the road to hell, uh, and put us on the road to heaven, uh, uh, took us, my friend, as a child of wrath, uh, and turned us into a child of God, uh, uh, pulled us out of the mire, uh, and put us in the choir, amen, uh, uh, took us off dope, uh, and put us on hope. Uh, I'm talking about uh, you sit here tonight, uh, and I sit here tonight, and had it not been for Calvary had it not been for Jesus had it not been for the blood had it not been for the love of the Father we would be destined without hope we would be without God but we have a birthright tonight hallelujah amen tonight as we sit under this tabernacle we have the same promises that Esau had do you realize that I want to say tonight, I deserve to go to hell and so do you. But I've been born again. Amen. And you know what being born again means? It means I have a birthright. It means I have the Father's honor. Amen. I'm glad I can raise my hand tonight and say that I'm a child of the King. Amen. I'm telling you, I'm a child of Him tonight. It means I have a family heritage. Amen. I mean, you may be here tonight and listen, you may uh, listen, your parents may not went to church. Uh, you may have never went to church a day in your life. Uh, but because of Calvary, uh, God reversed the curse for you in your life. Uh, and thank God you have a heritage uh, in this book. Uh, you have a heritage in Him. Uh, you have a family heritage tonight. I'm a part of the family of God. You know, I get in a church every now and then where they call each other by their name without putting brother and sister in front of that. And it always bothers me. I'm not being pharisaical. I'm just trying to be biblical. Amen. I'm telling you, when somebody just calls somebody without putting brother or sister in front of that, you say, well, preacher, why does it bother you? I'll tell you why it bothers me. I, I remember when I wasn't a brother. Amen. And don't you remember when you wasn't a sister? Amen. I'll tell you why I call people brother and sister. Because because we're in the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a family heritage tonight. Amen. Can I tell you, we got financial help, don't we? You know why you can send that $8,500 in tonight? I'm still going to preach it all through the sermon. Amen. Because God will take care of us. Brother, I don't tell you tonight, you may leave this meeting and y'all too. With not two nickels to rub together. You say, Preacher, why do I want to leave a meeting broke? I'll tell you why. Uh, brother, I've been to a lot of meetings uh, and tried to hold on to it. In fact, I was in, uh, I was in one camp meeting one time. Is it Faith Baptist Camp? I might as well tell you. And somebody gave me $300. Uh, and they said to me, they said, Now, you hold on to this because I'm going to need it when the camp meeting's over with. Uh, and I'll give it in the camp meeting. They already had some money they was going to give. Uh, and we we got down to Friday night and Brother Randy, Brother Allen got up. Uh, he was taking an offering up that night and he said we just need $300. Amen. He was sitting on this side of the tabernacle. I was sitting on that side. I said, God, I can't give his money. Uh, I mean, it's not mine to give away. And Brother Allen said, everybody pray. Somebody in this building's got $300. Uh, I said, Lord, I can't do that. It's not my money. I don't have $300. Uh, it's his $300. Uh, and God spoke to me just as clear as a bell. He shouldn't have gave it to you. Amen. And well, when I heard that, I just got up. I want to tell you, it's the easiest $300 I ever gave. Amen. And I started down that aisle. He is over there looking at me, shaking his head, saying, no, 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 don't, don't do that. And I'm going to tell you, we gave it anyway. And we both left broke. Amen. But I'll tell you, when you leave broke, you know how you also leave? You leave blessed. Amen. Because God always makes a way. He always 
pays them bills. He'll put gas in your tank. He'll put food in your cabinets. He'll help you pay the rent. Just go ahead and trust God. He will be good to you. Amen. And I got more tonight living for God than I ever would have living for the devil. You say you got a lot of money? No, but I'll tell you what I got. I got peace. And I got joy. And I got, I got goodness. And I got grace. Amen. And I got love. Oh, and I got mercy. Hallelujah. I got riches that money came by tonight. You want to talk about some help? I'm going to tell you there's some help in heaven's bank tonight. And it comes with the birthright. Amen. And then future hope. Thank God this world is not our home, amen. And in a world that's gone crazy and turned upside down and inside out and it ain't going to get no better for this world, I, I want to tell you tonight, we don't have to hang our heads low. I, we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to hide in our houses, amen. I, I, because the God of the good of the good times, I, he's a God in the bad times. I, he will not forget his children. He will take care of me. He will take care of you. I, in our future, the darker this world gets I, just looks brighter because any day now uh, Jesus is coming again uh, and oh what a hope we have in this hour tonight we have a birthright but as we see in this text do you know what the devil wants you to do tonight young people mom and dad and preacher pastor, missionary he wants you to sell that birthright I want to preach just a few minutes on that subject on don't sell your birthright. Don't sell your birthright. When I look at this text, I think about Esau. And when I see him in this text, I have to be honest with you tonight. I'm absolutely amazed that Esau would sell his birthright. Esau knew what it represented. He knew what it meant. And I've read it over and over many times and thought to myself, Esau, this is the most foolish thing that you've ever done in your life. How could you do something? Not only did you sell your birthright, but you sold it for something so cheap. Uh, something so temporary something that won't even last but a few moments uh, how could you do something like that and then it dawned on me I've watched in these 23 years of pastor in the church where I'm at I've watched a lot of them come in and you have too I've watched them get saved get born again uh, God be good to them uh, God bless them uh, uh, God honor them uh, uh, God listen pour his blessings out on them uh, and I've watched them sell their birthright Hey, young people, listen to me tonight. There's a lot of people used to stand where you stood. Amen. Hey, preacher, I'm glad you're preaching tonight, and I'm glad you're plowing, but do you know there's a lot of young preachers that stood where you young preachers are at tonight? And I'm glad you got some convictions and I'm glad you got some standards and you ought to. But I'm going to tell you tonight, there is coming a day and it's going to come more than once when the tempter's going to come and he's going to test you to see if you'll sell your birthright. I'm telling you, friend, that, listen, Esau was not out of the family, but what he did was he sold his blessings out. He got rid of everything that was supposed to be his. You know why? You say it was the providence of God and it was. But I'm going to tell you something, the sin in Jacob's life is he tried to have something without God giving it to him. And the sin in Esau's life is that he never loved or appreciated what God had put in his hands tonight. Here's the question that I want to answer for just a few moments or let the scriptures answer. Why would he do something so foolish? When you think about this text, why in the world would Esau sell something so valuable for a bowl of pottage. Why would he do that? I think there's four or five things in this text I want you to see and we'll be done. I want to say first of all, I believe he sold his birthright. Look at verse number 29, because he was fainting. The Bible says in verse 29, and Jacob sawed pottage and Esau came from the field. Notice this, and he was faint. He said in verse number 30, And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray this, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. I'm going to tell you what caused Esau to sell his birthright. Number one was he was fainting. 
Do you realize tonight that weariness is every bit as dangerous as worldliness? And if the devil can't get you to sell out in this world, he'll get you to burn out. He'll get you to get weary. And hey, you hear me tonight. There's no sin in working the flesh, but there is a sin in working in the flesh. Amen. You don't burn out by working the flesh. God gave us this body and we're to serve God with all of our strength and with all of our might. Isn't that right? But the sin comes when we trust the arm of the flesh and we put our confidence in ourselves and we think we can do it in our own strength and our own power and we don't pray and we don't lean on God and we don't seek God and we don't get filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, we got a lot of people today that are operating in the energy of the flesh and can I tell you what that will do? It will absolutely wear you out. Amen. The flesh gets tired tonight, friend. And I'm afraid there's a lot of preachers who have fallen prey because their flesh got weary. Esau's flesh was, was fainting. What made it flame, a faint? If you notice with me in verse number 29, the Bible says that Esau came from where? The field. Jesus said the field is a type of the world. And can I tell you tonight, this world will cause you to faint. I'm not saying we're out there living in sin. I'm not saying you're out there doing a bunch of wicked things. And you may be like the preacher said, and if so, you need to get right. But you may be here tonight and say, well, preacher, I'm not out there doing all them bad things. No, that may not be true, uh, true about you tonight. But I want you to understand, just living day by day in this world, if you don't walk with God, if you don't have a personal prayer life, if you don't take that book and pour it in your life, uh, if you don't let the Word of God dwell in, uh, richly in you, we're to read the Bible. We're to memorize the Bible. We're to study the Bible. We're to practice the Bible. We're to be doers of the Word of God. We're to share it. You see, the Bible ought to consume our life. And when you just live and go through the mechanics of, of work and service and church and you're not pouring in daily, here's what's going to happen. There's going to come times in your life when you are going to faint because the world will cause you to faint. I remind you what Esau did on this day he had done all of his life from the time he was a boy. He knew what he was doing and he knew how to do it. He knew how to go out and hunt. He was a great hunter, a great sportsman. Esau knew what time to go. He knew when to go. He knew how to, he knew how to hunt. But nevertheless, just because he knew how to do something and just because he was good, God had blessed him at what he could do. It didn't mean he wasn't going to faint. It didn't mean he wasn't going to get tired. And you hear me tonight. I know preachers tonight that have said, I've learned how to do this. Uh, and they have learned how to do it. They've learned how to build an outline. They've learned how to work a crowd. They've learned how to deliver a sermon. But they left out the most important thing. Power don't come from within. Power comes from above. Amen. I'm telling you, friend, you can break a text down. You can listen. You can dissect a text. Uh, but there's only one person that can lean over and blow behind that sermon and make it have a punch, uh, make it have power. We need the winds of another world uh, to blow when we preach. Uh, and young man, you need to learn that. You need to learn to get along with God uh, and get full of the Holy Ghost uh, or you will faint. Hallelujah. I tell you, can I just say this? What bothers me about young preachers today is they don't know how to hide themselves. Amen. You know what social media has done is ruined young preachers because they think everybody's got to know what they're doing. In the Bible, listen, God told Elijah to go hide himself. We got young preachers calling themselves Elijah. You're not no Elijah. Amen. You're not a good widow woman if you want to know the truth about it. <laughs> Come on now. And preachers, uh, young men, they got too much to say. I'm probably going to really get myself in a mess right here, but it's John Morgan's fault. Amen. I don't know. But you know, I'm not being critical when I make this statement, but I'm 46 years old. I'm not a young man. I'm not an old man. But can I be honest with you? I don't feel like I have a whole lot of advice to just shell out to people. I don't have like a, feel like I've got a whole lot of wisdom and things to say. Most of the things I've learned has been through observation and 
past, been through my own mistakes, uh, but I don't feel like I could write a book uh, on how to do this or how to do that. And I'm not criticizing people that do, uh, but I'm just amazed at young men uh, uh, that, listen, they've got podcasts and they've got all kinds of uh, things going on. Uh, I'm not talking about a preaching podcast. Uh, I'm just talking about they got all this wisdom. I'm probably on an island by myself, but I don't really give a rip. Uh, I'm telling you tonight, friend, uh, uh, the older men of God that I set at their feet, and many of them's already gone on, and most of you here tonight said, hello, they taught us to keep our ears open and our mouths shut. They taught us when older men speak. Uh, they ended up amazing that men that have the wisdom and have much to say don't say much. <laughs> and the men that don't know nothing and haven't proved nothing have so much to say. I went in our Bible college one night. I'm going to tell you, listen, they got something in their crawl and I got something in my crawl a little bit bigger. I had four or five of them bow up on me. And I said, listen, I said, this has been a few years ago. Uh, but I said, you, I said you, you don't even know what real preaching is. One of them said, oh, I do. I said, oh, you do. And I said, I just went one by one. I started with the one on the right. I said, I'm going to tell you, I drive by your house every day. Your yard's about four, four feet high. Grass hadn't been mowed. You got an old bed sheet in your, in, in your window that says Jesus saves, which is a disgrace. I said, if that's your ministry, I said, your ministry, if it's like your house, it ain't going to be nothing. Amen. One by one. Brother Frank's here tonight. He'll tell you. I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you. It's amazing how far we've come. Young men don't steal away and pray that much anymore. They want to be seen. They, they got something to say. I, I'll tell you what's happening to them. They're fainting in the day of adversity. That's why they're going another way. They've never really got it nailed down in their soul. Uh, they've never really saw themselves for who they are. Uh, they trust self-sufficiency. They don't realize uh, that they've never preached in Holy Ghost power. I'm not an authority on it. But I'm going to tell you, I know when I got it and I know when I don't. Amen. Uh, and I know I need it every time I get up. Uh, I'm not about a thousand. Amen. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing. I want to. Amen. And if he don't help me, there will be no preaching. Hallelujah. And I don't want to faint. This field we're living in tonight, I'm going to tell you the only way you're going to stay with God in old time religion, you're going to have to stay on your knees. And you're going to have to realize how small you really are. I want to say tonight, why did he sell his birthright? There's a lot of them compromised. There's a lot of them left this way. They like the shout, they like the glory, but they don't want to pay the price. They've went another way. You know why? Because it's easy. And they're living on easy street tonight. They've traded in because uh, they fainted in the way. I'm going to tell you, young man, you're going to have to learn to take a stand. It doesn't matter which way your family goes. It doesn't matter which way your friends go. It doesn't matter what others do. Don't boast about it. Just be faithful to it. Amen. I'm going to tell you, my children was growing up. I, I never would get up and say they won't do this and they won't do that because I always had that fear in my heart. But I did get on my knees and say, dear God, please, uh, let them live for you all the days of their life. Uh, keep them from sin and Satan. Uh, and Lord, save their souls and help them to marry in the perfect will of God. Uh, and dear God, fill them with Holy Ghost power. Uh, let them walk, uh, walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit. Uh, I'm just saying, my friend, tonight, uh, I realize uh, I don't want to faint, do you? And can I tell you tonight, the biggest fear in my heart, Brother Rains was preaching the other night, and he made a great statement. He said, I just want to finish right. And when I heard him make that statement, I said, Dear God, more than anything, I want to finish right, don't you? I don't know if it'll be a house full or a handful, but don't you want to finish right? I don't want to faint. He, he sold his birthright because he was faint. And then I want to say tonight, he sold his birthright. Look at verse number 31. Because he was framed. The Bible says in verse number 31, and Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. If you go back up, the Bible says that he sawed, verse 29 is where I want to go, and Jacob sawed pottage. I noticed that the person who framed him was his own brother. You hear me tonight? It won't be the world that gets you to change courses. 
It'll be the contemporary crowd. And it won't be the church that, you won't go to the church that immediately has the dark light, a ceiling and, and the rock band and, and the preacher up there with no pulpit and long hair and a t-shirt and a pair of knee knockers on. Listen, in sandals, that's not the first place you're going to stop. Oh, no, friend, when you leave the house of bread, when you leave that place of blessing, you know where you go? You go where it's just a little bit like where you was and a little bit where you want to be. It's a Babylonian church, uh, uh, my friend, that you go to, uh, uh, that they got their way of worship. Uh, and listen, it just uh, just mixing it. I won't be honest with you tonight. I don't want to mix old time religion with anything else. Amen. It's good enough, my friend. It was good enough the day I got saved, brother. Uh, it's good enough when I was a young man uh, in my teens. Uh, it was good enough in my twenties when we got married. It was good enough to raise my children on. Uh, it was good enough then. Uh, it's it's good enough now. I don't want to mix it with nothing. Hallelujah. I mean, I'm telling you tonight, friend, why would you want to mix something that's so wonderful? Why would you want to mix Amazing Grace with anything? I was in a church one day, and they started singing Amazing Grace, and I said, wait a minute, I've heard Amazing Grace all my life, but that's not the way I heard Amazing Grace, son. Why we want to change Newton's song? Amen. I mean, why we, and then it got to the end of it and said, My chains are gone. I said, I feel like somebody just put some on me. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, that just appeals to the flesh. Am I telling you the truth? Uh, it's a frame up what they're trying to do. Young people, you hear me tonight. There's going to come a day when you're going to walk through some dark shadows and dark valleys. Uh, there's going to come a day when bad news is going to come to your doorstep. Uh, there's going to come a day, my friend, when you're going to have hard times. Uh, that contemporary crowd's not going to pray you out of nothing. Uh, that blended crowd uh, won't be there. I'll tell you what you'll need in that hour. You'll need an anchor that is both steadfast and sure. You'll need some old time religion. You'll need something that's real. You'll need something that'll hold on to you when you can't hold on to it. Oh, hallelujah. I say bless his name. I say bless the Lord. I want to say tonight, it's still real. It's still real. Old time religion is still real. Hallelujah. Woo! Just give me that old time religion. Just give me old time preaching and old time singing and old time praying and old time living. I say just give me that old time religion. Hallelujah. Woo! Praise God. Amen. I want to tell you, it's as good tonight as it's ever been all my life. Isn't it good tonight, Brother John? I, I'm telling you, camp meeting is as good in 2021 as it ever has been and it ever will be. Hallelujah. The God of yesterday, he's the God of today. I want to tell you tonight, don't you let some worldly contemporary I like what Brother Randy said, Las Vegas. I'm going to yeah. use that. <laughs> Style worship yeah. with the funny lights. I was preaching for a man. He said, they might get some of them lights. I said, oh, don't do that. He said, it's just lights. It's no big deal. I said, if it's no big deal, don't get them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you tonight, I'm not going that way. Hallelujah. Yeah. I'm not going that way, praise God. You say, why are you not going that way? Because I found a better way, hallelujah. A way you ain't got to pump it up. You ain't got to make it up. You ain't got to fake it up. I will tell you, I have found the way. It's real. It's right. It's good. It's holy, hallelujah. Woo! I don't want nobody framing me up, amen. I'm telling you, listen, there's a lot of brethren. I'm not beating up on them. I thank God for the brethren, but they sometimes, uh, you're just going to have to say goodbye to some people. You don't have to attack them. You don't have to hurt them, but let them go their way, and you go yours, amen. We'll see each other at the judgment seat. Amen. Why did he sell his birthright? 
Why would anybody sell old time religion? Why would anybody sell years of preaching the King James Bible? Why would they sell years of dressing right and wearing a dress, women and young men wearing long pants uh, and looking right? Why would they sell all that stuff? Uh, why would they sell out uh, and go to church uh, where it doesn't sound like a, a church no more and they don't have a choir? Why would they do that? Some of them got fa- uh, listen, they, they got fa- uh, listen, they fainted in the way and some of them, uh, they got framed. They followed their friends, didn't they? The influences, I want to tell you, that's why it's so important for you to read your Bible every day and make sure the most important influence in your life is the Word of God because it'll never change. I want to say tonight, why, Esau, did you sell your birthright, right? Because he was faint, because he was framed, and then because he was famished. Look what he said in verse 32, verse number 32, and Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die. Esau said what every one of us has said when we get hungry. How many times have you said something to your wife or you young people, your parents said, Man, if I don't get something to eat, I'm going to die. I mean, look at us. Most of us, well, listen, most of us, we got enough stored up for Y3K. You know that. I'm going to tell you. You may die of coronavirus. You may die of a heart attack. You may die of cancer. But ain't none of us sitting here not going to die of starvation. I promise you that much. It's going to be a long time before that happens. Man, you know what? We get hungry. We say, man, I've got to get something to eat. If I don't get something to eat in the next few, min- in the next few minutes, I'm going to die. <laughs> 300 pounds. I've never seen a 300-pound man starve to death of you. You know what we're saying when we make that statement? We're making an announcement. My flesh, it is so hungry. I got to have something right now. Right now. Oh, my flesh is so hungry. And he saw come in and Jacob set the atmosphere. It wasn't a coincidence. He was boiling pottage. He set the mood. He set the atmosphere. He got everything just right because he knew when he knew when Esau would be coming in, and he knew that Esau would be starving to death. And Esau, when he smelled that food, that flesh rose up and said, "I'm hungry." I'm gonna tell you tonight. If we don't start, you don't hear a lot of preaching about crucifying the flesh, consecration, dedication, separation. We don't keep our flesh beat down. We don't keep it under, on the cross and keep it under control. I'm going to tell you what will happen. It will control us. You know why so many people selling their birthright? They're giving into the flesh. They're going an easier way. They're tired of the battle. They fainted in the day of adversity. So they sell out everything they've ever stood for. People used to run the aisles and shout. People used to live like, 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 like what we're living tonight. Uh, now they look at us uh, and they, 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 act, they act like we're the problem. We act like they act like uh, that, that, that they just never lived that way uh, really in their heart. I don't believe that. Now some, they never were saved. They were playing the game. Uh, but I know some tonight, uh, they bleated every bit as much as you and I did. And I'm going to tell you what happened, Fred. The flesh never gives up. I'm going to tell you this flesh will stay hungry until the day it dies. Amen. It may lose its appetite uh, from time to time, but I promise you uh, it'll rise back up again. Uh, it'll want something to eat. Uh, I mean, now listen, you think about the flesh tonight. Do you realize everything that tastes good, you're not supposed to eat? How many of y'all believe that? And, and I've done every diet in the world. How many of y'all go ahead and confess it? Okay, I'm the only one. I've done every diet in the world. I mean, I've, I've, lost, I've lost a 1,000 pounds and been on 79 diets over the last 10 years, but I just ain't lost it all at the same time. That's right. And here's what I found out. I'd, I'd read this diet, count calories. This diet, count carbs. No, don't count carbs. This diet, eat this food that we made and it tastes just like 
you know, chocolate cake it tastes like chocolate cake, so you pay $20 for a slice of that chocolate cake that's supposed to take. You know why you do that? That's the dumbest thing in the world, but your flesh is hungry for something it's not supposed to have. I see these little skinny people running around. And these health nuts, you know. I mean, if you want to suck on raisins and you want to eat, you know, I mean, persimmons and drink carrot juice the rest of your life, help yourself. You'll probably live two years longer than I will, but I'll tell you one thing. Them 24 months ain't worth the 24 years of misery. You've got to live in to get it, amen. Isn't that right? And then when somebody gets on a diet, all of a sudden they want to start preaching to you. Isn't that right? What, you, you hippo, amen? Crit. Man, tell me one time, I was sitting there, he's on a diet, and the only reason they're, they're telling you that because they're bitter. I'm sitting there, and he, he, he's on a diet, and he said, you know, how many, you know how many calories in that hamburger? I said, the same amount was in it the last time you ate it, amen? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's why some people are so mean, because they, they, they had a good gravy biscuit in so long. Only, yeah, the only problem with it is the principle's really wrong. You know that, don't you? Everything that's healthy. And don't come up to me after church and say, oh, I love my garden salads with my croutons. I don't believe that neither. I like a, you know what? I like a garden salad with a whole lot of meat dumped in it and every kind of dressing you can put on it, amen? And I still got to have some good food to eat with it. Isn't that right? That's just to keep you regular. You know that. Everybody knows that. You know that's the truth. Little bit of, little bit of greens. <laughs> Come on now. You know it's right. But you know what? You eat that stuff. You know what? You eat it. You, 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 don't, you know good and well. You'd rather eat three biscuits. I just eat one salad. You know that. Do you know what happens? You get your flesh on that stuff. That's all it wants, ain't it? That's all it wants. Man, I got stashes all over my house my wife don't know about. <laughs> this ain't on the internet, is it? Oh, God help. <laughs> hey, I, I know why you're confessing now, Brother Randy. I'm just, I'm just lying, Miss Nolita. I go someplace and they'll give me a bag of Oreos and I'll come home and I, I got places I put it where my son-in-laws and my daughters can't find it, you know. But the flesh craves, it hungers for the things of this world that is not good for it. And I'm going to tell you why a lot of people have sold their birthright because they listen to their flesh. I'm going to tell you tonight because he was famished but I'm going to tell you why he sold his birthright because he was faithless look what he said in verse number 31 verse number 32 and Esau said behold I am at the point to die and look what he I can't believe he says this what profit shall this birthright do to me I read that and I thought Esau you know what it means how could you stand there and say, what profit? I'm going to tell you why. He was a man of no faith. The Bible says he was a profane man. And this never meant nothing to Esau to begin with, so it never meant nothing to him in the end. You want to know why some people can grow up in a youth group with a mom and dad that loves God, puts them in a Christian school and has family altar every night of their life, and the minute they turn 18, 19 years old, they say, they say goodbye to the church. They say goodbye to the preacher. They walk away from the youth group and they go out in the world as if it never. I mean, they, they walk away with no, no tears shed. Hey, some of you young people sitting here tonight, you know your parents know that you're not where you need to be at with God. They've wept many tears for you, but you've yet, you've yet to weep the first tear for your own self and for almost breaking their heart tonight. I would say to every young person, there's a lot of reasons you ought to live for God. I tell you, don't you break God's heart who loved you and kept you out of 
hell and don't you break your parents' heart who fed you and put a roof over you and brought you in this world and nourished you and loved you. I'll tell you though, while some people can walk away, it never meant nothing in the beginning and so it doesn't mean nothing now. And you'll know why some preachers can quit and why some churches fold. It never meant nothing to them. I want to tell you something tonight. This means more to me. Can you say amen to that? This means more to me tonight than anything. I want you to know tonight that King James Bible means more to me tonight. I don't want an ESV, amen. I don't want an RSV. I don't want an NIV. I don't even want to study them. I don't want them sitting on my shelf. I'm not using them as a commentary. Hey, I'm not using them for kindling. Amen. I'm telling you, friend, I don't want them. You say why? Because that book right there, it means the world to me. It saw me through the hardest times in life. It picked me up when I was lost. It brought me in the family of God. It means something. And that book's got to mean something. To you tonight, it is valuable. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. Dressing right, I, there's more wrong with me than I'd ever tell you about. I don't have it all together. But dressing right means something to me. I'm not a Pharisee and I'm not a legalist. But I've never seen anybody preach with the power of God who compromised it. There's something different about when you walk into church and people have modesty about them. Not just at church. There's, there's a fragrance that's there. It's not them. Holiness pleases God. And you're never going to put too much on. Amen. You're never going to cut it too close. You're never going to live too clean. You're never going to, we're never going to be, don't worry about getting too holy. Cause don't get too happy about that because we never are. But I want to tell you something tonight. It means something. It's profitable to do these things. What profit does this birthright mean? You know why he sold it? He had no faith. Young person, you may be here tonight and you say, well, I'll tell you one thing. As soon as I can, I'm cutting loose. Oh, I'm not going to get out of church, but I'm going to go to them churches where anything goes. Where you come as you are and leave as you were. I'm going to go to them churches where, where they sing. They sing them songs. They just sing them different. I'm going to tell you something. You're faithless tonight. I have no... I'm not being mean when I make a statement. I have no sympathy tonight for a church brat that wants to feel sorry for themselves because they had godly parents who wouldn't let them go out and date, and wouldn't let them listen to rock music, wouldn't let them listen to country music. They want to go off and join some, you know, some, some podcast somewheres and run down uh, everybody that ever cared about them and ever tried to keep them out of hell. I have no sympathy for that crowd. Want to talk about how they've been hurt. Can I be honest with you tonight? I don't understand that. When they talk about, oh, I got hurt in this movement. I know everything's not perfect. It ain't perfect in any movement. You know that? And they say, well, I got hurt. No, that ain't why you got out. I don't believe that for one minute. You say, but preacher, I know people that really got hurt. I'm going to tell you something tonight why I don't believe that. I was raised in a drunkard's home. I got saved at 13 years of age. I, I didn't have the Bibles in my house. I, my parents had let me go do anything I wanted to, and I'm not boasting that young people. I didn't want to do that way. I got saved. I wanted godly parents. I, I wanted somebody to put some rules on me. I wanted somebody somebody to tell me, no, you can't do this and you can't do that. And thank God there was, you know who? Uh, the mother who the Holy Ghost uh, living on the inside. Uh, I'd have gave anything uh, to have parents uh, uh, like that that love God. Amen. My parents are saved tonight and I thank God for that. But I'm telling you tonight, don't you sell. Don't you sell your birthright. The prophet Eternal prophet. And I will say it in closing. He saw, why'd you sell your birthright? Because he was faithless. He was so foolish. And then finally he was furious. You know, it's interesting. This text starts out with Esau, or with Jacob, boiling, boiling pottage. And it ends in verse number 34 with Esau, boiling mad. 
over his birthright. You see, there's no sin in eating pottage. There's no sin in that. The sin is what it was going to cost him to eat this pottage. Young person, you may be here tonight, or adult, mom and dad, I appreciate you. we preach the young people, but I tell you, hey, some mom and dad's in trouble. Mom and dad, you let your children have a cell phone. Send them down a road they can't return back on. You're putting a viper in their hand and praying they don't get bit. I'm going to tell you tonight, you might be sitting here and say, well, preacher, what I'm thinking about doing the church, I'm thinking about going to, there's no sin in it. Maybe not within itself. What is it going to cost you? What's it going to cost you to do that? What's it going to cost you to date that person? What's it going to cost you to leave that old-fashioned church and go to that church? What's it going to cost you, preacher, to walk away from that church that barely pays your salary or maybe doesn't pay your salary, but you can go down here to this church. Now, they don't have the same standards and they don't use all the same cur- uh, curriculum that, you, that you're used to, but you can go down here and, and they can take care of it. What's, what's that bowl going to cost you? may cost you your birthright. Your testimony tonight is eternal and you cannot put a price tag on it. I wouldn't sell out for a college, a camp, a church. Amen. Cash. Amen. Cars. Clothes. A degree. I wouldn't wouldn't sell my birthright tonight for any of that. I want to ask you this question as we stand. Really not a question. I just want to plead with you. Don't sail out. Come to the end of this meeting. Please don't sail out, preacher. Don't stop standing where you've always stood. Please don't change. I'm not impressed. When your kids are this small and you say what you believe, and it's good, but where are you going to stand when they get this tall? What line are you going to hold when they get 14, 15, and 16, and 17, and all their friends in the youth group is doing one thing? You've always said, no, we're not going to go that way. Don't you sell your birthright in the heat of the battle of your children's life? You know what they need? When they're fighting the battle of their life and the enemy's coming against them, I tell you what they need. They need a mom and daddy who will be strong in the Lord. It'll hold tight. It will not faint in a day of adversity. Tonight, while our heads are bowed, eyes are closed.